All right, guys. <clears throat> the Renaissance today, um, AP World. Renaissance is a game changer. It's a quantum leap forward, and it comes to human civilization. Uh, we've been in Europe has been in the depths of the Dark Ages since Rome fell, and it went through the Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages, and the Crusades brings Europe back into touch with the rest of the world, the world that had kept progressing with um, the uh, Hebrew scholars, the Islamic scholars, the Byzantine scholars, preserving Greco-Roman learning. Um, so um, all of a sudden these ideas come back, um, ideas of the madrasas from um, the Middle East, and we get the world's first universities in Bologna and places like that. And when I always talk about vernacular, you know, the sophomore vernacular, bra, lit, cabin, um, all that stuff, vernacular is the common language of the people. Educated people are using Latin. Some of the common people are speaking their local language. In this case, it is Italian. And all of those ideas of art and architecture and politics and banking and industry and trading are being brought back to Europe and they all come to a confluence in the city of Florence. And in Florence, we have this guy, we'll talk about him a little bit later, Dante Allegri. All right? He is going to write his Inferno, the modern perceptions of heaven and hell in Italian making the learned aristocrats, the old nobility, read and speak the peasant language. But here we are in the great city of Florence, the home of the Medici family. The Medicis are going to be great patrons of the arts, very similar to Harun al-Rashid in the Islamic world. And it is here where the Renaissance will be signified by the great church here in the city of Florence. The Duomo capped with one of the largest domes, third largest dome in Europe. Ideas taken from the old Roman Pantheon and the United States Capitol building all the way um, going back to this, this great Renaissance work of art in the Duomo. Filippo Brunelleschi creates it. And because it's so big, Nobody will think that it can stand. So if you go to the inside, you can see the brickwork running horizontal and vertical and at a 45 degree angle. It's actually seven different arches all reinforcing each other. The strength of it is incredible. Each arch, remember back in Rome, the more weight you put on it, the stronger it becomes, disperses the weight, making this huge dome very strong. Also, to decorate it, it is painted. So if you're down below in the church and you look up, you see the first look at what is known as perspective, adding dimensions to the artwork. So this is just an incredible, incredible new bit of technology. And it's here in Florence that we call as the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance, where it kicks off this new era in Europe. It is akin to the Neolithic Revolution, or maybe the Industrial Revolution, or possibly the modern technological revolution. This is a huge game changer in human history. And the word Renaissance simply means rebirth. And what is rebirth is the idea of learning and knowledge, and philosophy, and history. It'll last from about 1300 all the way up to about 1600, where we re rediscover the workings of the ancient world, Greece, Rome, Byzantium, Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia. Right? Things are going to be recreated and rediscovered and added on to all those great things that the scientists and mathematicians did in Alexander's House of Muses are going to come back. And Italy is going to be the center point 
for the Renaissance. The old Roman Empire had fallen. And Italy at this time was broken up into different city-states, like Savoy, Corsica, Naples, the Republic of Florence. It's different independent little kingdoms or regions. And these regions are important to politics because they're no longer dominated by old aristocratic nobles, but it is wealthy merchants and bankers. People taking advantage of the Silk Road trade or even a little bit of the Trans-Sahara trade, shipping trade, like Marco Polo from Venice supposedly going over to China. They are doing and making money by trading and business. And so in Florence, we have this republican form of government where um, the government is being run by elected officials. All right, People are going to elect representatives. Now, is the common man represented? Probably not so much as much as it is by these wealthy merchants and bankers, like the famous Medici family. And while we do have the veneer, the gloss of a democracy, it still is pretty much a dictatorship. The people with a lot of money dictate the rules and what's going on, like the um, Medici. It's going to be the most famous of all Medici's, Lorenzo um, of Medici. And what we have here in the Renaissance is artists, like the famous Ninja Turtle artists, Raphael and Donatello and Michelangelo and, and, Michelangelo and Leonardo, are going to use not only math, but they're also going to look to ancient Greece and Rome for inspiration. Here we have one of the most famous of all paintings known as the School of Athens. And what was kind of neat about the Renaissance artists is they would paint their likenesses inside the painting. So here we have the um, artist, we're going to get to it in a little bit, is conversing with Socrates. Or they're able to put their human humanism. What can humans achieve inside these paintings using math, the golden ratio, and um, perspective? We'll get to that here in a few minutes. And I just mentioned humanism. Humanism, <clears throat> all right, is the intellectual movement that focuses on the human potential. What can an individual accomplish, all right? What can Luke and Owen accomplish? What can Molly accomplish, all right? What can Carter accomplish? What can Caleb and Caleb accomplish? What can you do, can Riley and Laney accomplish on the ladies' basketball court? What can they actually do? And they want to carry on classical traditions. Classical is the ancient world, like Greece and Rome. So we want to look at the humanities. Humanities is the study of history, of culture, of language, and music. What is the human element? All right? Like we're talking a lot about, you know, the National Science and Math Initiative, you know, STEM. That's all well and good. All right, love science and math, but you need to have a little bit of humanities in them. They say the best doctors love the humanities because they have that human empathetic, you know, link to it. So, um, what we want to do is also think about why does everything got to be so dire and miserable and, 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 and like boring and, and penitent? How can we live a happy life that pleases God without going overboard and sinning. So that is going to be the thought process of the Renaissance. And here is where we're going to start with the Ninja Turtle artists. All right. Um, first up is Donatello. And Donatello is known for making life-sized, realistic sculptures, sort of going back to ancient Rome. He's so good, he even makes a sculpture of himself. But you can see the look on his face, face the creases in his beard, the wrinkles on his um, cloak, and kind of the look of concentration he has on his face. And 
we're going to have a little bit of humanistic meeting religion. Religion is still important. So here is, you know, um, St. George, a famous, you know, saint and a slayer of, of dragons. But these are going to be life-size. They're not going to be small. They're going to be big. They're going to convey human um, emotion out of bronze and out of marble. And Donatello was an excellent sculptor. What gets him into a lot of trouble is the Medici's have him sculpt and conscript this statue. This is of young David holding the sword, standing atop of the head of the slain giant Goliath. And Donatello took a lot of criticism because, as you can see, David has long hair, and yes, he is an egg, but he's kind of a slight, slender little guy, and they said he looks very effeminate. A, why does he have to be naked? And B, you made him look like a tiny young boy or almost like a girl. And Donatello was like, well, yeah, if you read the passage, King David wasn't a full-grown man. He was a, he was a young boy. That is my interpretation of this young shepherd boy who stepped up and still was able. He's got Goliath's sword, but he's hanging on to his slingshot, that is what I vision that he looks like. It is my artistic representation. And so it creates a lot of controversy as he was paid to make this famous statue. But it's extremely um, realistic. Now here is St. George, another Donatello painting. And what it does is it uses perspective. Here we have this dragon coming out of the dark caves, and here is this dark storm in the sky, and here comes St. George as he smites and destroys this dragon. This is good triumphing over evil. And in the beginning, um, St. George and the dragon and this fair maiden are painted big, and in the back, we have the sunlight coming up over the mountains, which are drawn much smaller, giving the painting depth. This is, you know, not only good versus evil, but this is the light of education coming back into the world, destroying the darkness and the tyranny and the evil of the Middle Ages. Um, that may or may not be what Donatello was after, but that's pretty much the interpretation of the um, painting. And he was also known for making stories, like cartoon comic strips. And again, this one has a religious undertone. This is Herod's feast, where Herod is being asked for, if you want to give me a gift, then I want the head of Sir John the Baptist here on a plate. And over here is the relief of John the Baptist's head on a plate, a famous Old Testament um, uh, uh, our biblical story being partaken. So you can see the story, lifelike emotion, this guy going, oh no, what did you just do? You made the promise, King Herod, you have to fulfill um, uh, your vow, and John the Baptist will be um, executed. Even if you couldn't read, you could follow that story like a comic strip. Now we get to my favorite Ninja Turtle artist, and that is Michelangelo. Michelangelo <clears throat> um, is famous for painting and sculpting. He's so famous, even Disney put him in the um, uh, Epcot Center, um, the, the golf ball ride, which they're changing, much to my heart's dismay, um, uh, talking about um, human history. You know, sculpture, painting, art, and poetry. Um, just a very brilliant, brilliant guy. And he's going to look back to ancient Greece and the lifelike, you know, um, humanistic um, idealism, taking the Discobolus, the, the symbol of ancient Greece, and making it modern with this great statue of Poseidon there. He's missing his trident like he's getting ready to throw it. Um, these are just, you know, some sculptures um, that he began working on as he gets even more famous. There's the the um, statue that I had Michelangelo um, make of me. Oh, oops. Um, sorry, I was a little um, heavy back then. But when um, I went on one of those new keto diets and got on my Nutrisystem, I wound up looking like this. 
Um, that is not me. That is a little joke for everyone out there. Ha, ha, ha. This is the famous statue of the David, one of Michelangelo's masterpieces. And when he was done, everyone was awestruck. They said, oh my God, that is a beautiful statue that you carved. And he says, no, the statue was always there. I just cleared away the pieces. And I think he was like 19 years old or something like that when he makes this. But if you look at it, it's 26 feet tall from base to the top. And it is again about David slaying Goliath. And if you get up close, you can see that the head and the hands are a little bit bigger in perspective than the rest of the body. And what that is meant to convey is to Michelangelo, the thing that separates man from animals is our ability to think, form of a plan, and then act on it with his slingshot draped over his shoulder. Man's ability to reason, to problem solve. Um, and it's got one of those things, if you look at it, the eyes seem to follow you wherever you are going. Very lifelike, brilliant um, statue. He's most famous for painting the roof of the Sistine Chapel with being up on top of the roof um, with wet plaster and then painting it. It was falling down on him. He looked like a complete and total um, crazy man um, on his scaffold. Um, it took him, you know, like, you know, just forever um, to do. And he would work for like hours at a time, maybe take like an hour off and then go back to work and then maybe sleep for a week. He kind of lost track of time and what day it was in this beautiful lifelike pattern. And if you go there, the exact center of the Sistine Chapel is God touching Adam. And this is in the, it used to be the private chapel of the Pope in um, Vatican City. And if you get up to it, the fingers are about almost exactly one inch apart. And if you go there, it's just absolutely breathtaking how uh, Michelangelo and his students were able to do this. And almost the curtains on the sidewall almost look lifelike. They're so incredible. If you guys get a chance to go there, there it is in the um, exact center. Here's the entire um, Sistine Chapel. In the back is something weird. Right here... Um, angels are taking up this thing. It's like kind of flopped over. It's kind of like this. And it is the skin of Michelangelo, kind of a work of modern art. And he says, you know, when you die, all I'm left with is my skin. My bones will turn um, to dust. So he painted his own skin without the bone structure in it. And down here, um, there's a lot of corruption in the church. And the Pope actually, uh, Michelangelo tried to flee. The Pope arrested him and brought him back. So going down in here, going into hell, is a powerful cardinal, archbishop, and the Pope. And they're going down into hell. They're looking back, kind of like, oh, please um, uh, forgive me. Well, everybody else is ascending to heaven. So when you can script an artist, boy, you better be nice to him because he can make you immortal and eternally famous by showing your likeness going into um, hell. It was so beautiful that they really couldn't get um, him in any trouble for it. And then last but not least is the Pieta. And this is in St. Peter's Basilica. This is the only work of art that Michelangelo ever signed. Um, right here on the crease of Mary's robe, he wrote Michelangelo. It's Mary taking Jesus down off of the cross. Again, you see the sadness on her face, the wrinkles on the robes and um, cloth. You know, it, it just looks incredibly lifelike. It was attacked um, in the 1970s and someone broke off some of Mary's fingers, but it was, they were reattached and now it's behind like thick um, bulletproof glass. We used to be able to get um, right up to it. Next Ninja Turtle we have is Raphael. On the modern movies, he's the guy that's um, uh, angry all the time. And he is known for architecture and painting. And it's Raphael that did the School of Athens I mentioned earlier. So here is Raphael, and he's talking to Socrates, 
Down here is Leonardo. Over here is um, Michelangelo. Again, Renaissance florist, Florence, all these guys are there right about the same time or at the same time. Just this incredible, incredible period in world history. And so at the front of the painting, we have people and objects, you know, squares using geometry painted larger. So it looks like they're getting ready to come out of the screen. And in the back, our eye focuses on this arch and this light where things are painted smaller, giving like that three-dimensional look at the um, painting, intentionally done by Raphael, a technique developed um, at this time. There is the original um, uh, before it was cleaned. All these thinkers and people in the School of Athens talking about the reawakening in humanities and in knowledge. And I focused on Socrates and Raphael talking to each other. And here is probably the most famous one that started it all, the marriage of the virgin. Um, here using the squares of um, geometry, kind of like a parabola, Think of like train tracks going off in the distance. We know the train tracks are the same width, but it looks like they touch in the distance. And in the back, we have this small door where there is white light. And then following the square as we come to the front, where the bride and the groom are saying their wedding vows. You look at the closeness right here in the front of the painting. Then your eye is trained to the back and things get smaller, that you know, parabola. And all of a sudden, it gives that depth and dimension to the painting here invented by um, Raphael. Same with the um, birth of Venus <clears throat> running behind here, so I'm going to have to um, pick this up a little bit. And last but not least, the most multi-talented of the Ninja Turtle artists, and that is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he was known as a scientist, inventor, painter, mechanic, visionary. He could write his name, Leonardo da Vinci, forwards and backwards at the same time with either hand. My wife can do it. It's cool. I can't even um, uh, uh, come close. And he uses, again, the golden mean in mathematics to form the Mona Lisa, probably one of the most famous paintings in the world. A um, lot of intrigue around it. Is it a man? Is it a woman? I think does it matter. This one over here is the original. You can see he's got some more scenery, some sea cliffs and, and, and water behind him. But if you pattern it out, the focus on the weird smile using the golden ratio is almost the exact center of the upper part of the painting. Now, the painting used to be much, 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 much bigger, but it has been stolen and the canvas cut so many times. Um, it is now um, uh, very small. But Leonardo came up with ideas from like an, an ancient tank to a helicopter to a hot air balloon to different siege engines and inventions. Um, an ancient scuba tank, an airplane. The man was light years ahead of his time. And he's most famous for the thing, the Vitruvian man, the, I mean, the universal man. Leonardo studied anatomy and actually got corpses to look at muscles and tendons to make his artwork more lifelike and also wrote it down to help study human anatomy and how the body works and medicine. And so Leonardo da Vinci is like a jack of all trades or what we would call a renaissance man. Somebody who is good at many different things and it's Leonardo who more than anybody embodies the human um, or the idea of the um, Renaissance. There's his old hang glider, airplane, covered walkway, um, siege engine. And I would be remiss if we did not talk about ladies. This is a lady here, Sophie Nesba um, Ansangula. And she was an incredibly good painter, um, a lot of good depth and, and perspective to her painting. Uh, but in a very patriarchal society, her brother, she signed her brother's names to his paintings, and he sold them. And one day coming to Italy was um, King Charles of Spain, Habsburg, very, very, very wealthy, Charles V. And he said, man, I want to hire this guy as my court painter. 
So they went and got Sophonesba's brother, and he was like, uh, your highness, I'd love to come be your court painter, but I'm not the guy really doing it. It's my sister. So enraptured with the works of art was King Charles V, that Sophonesba, a woman, was got to go to Spain and was the court painter for the wealthiest, probably most powerful monarch in Europe um, at, at the time. So we're done with the artwork now, and now we are going to move on to literature here. And here we have Niccolo Machiavelli. And during the very short period of time that Florence was its own actual um, republic, Machiavelli worked for the government. And the Medicis had all these political, political wranglings coming into and um, out of power, and Machiavelli was fired. Um, he was on the outs. And so he writes a book in 1513 titled The Prince, and it was his ideas on how a perfect ruler should rule. How can a political leader gain and maintain an advantage? And in the book, he asks, is it better to be feared as a ruler, or is it better to be loved? And Machiavelli's conclusion was that it is better to be feared, all right? Rule through fear. He says, sometimes it is necessary for a ruler to lie to or even mislead his people or lie to his enemies. What Machiavelli says, the end justifies the means. The people don't need to do everything. Sometimes you got to do things as a ruler that you may not want to do, but it's better for everybody's safety. So he's kind of like this sketchy guy. And so when you hear the term Machiavellian, it means somebody who is always scheming, who is lying, who is manipulating to further their own agenda. They will do whatever it takes to advance or to win. The end justifies um, uh, uh, the, the means. So, here's his big quote, he should not deviate from what is good. So you're supposed to do what's right, if it's possible, but you should also know how to do evil if the situation calls for it. So your main intention is too good, but if you got to drop the hammer on somebody, don't hold anything back, drop the hammer um, uh, on them. And so, moving farther north, we're going to get up into Belgium, um, where we're going to get um, Jan and Hubert van Eyck. And what they are going to be known for is oil paintings. Now, because they're up in the low countries, in the Netherlands, where it's wet and damp, they are going to use more oil-based paint, right, like glossy paint. So it's durable. It maintains its vibrancy. Now, with watercolors, you can like wash your hands and clean up. Oil paints, man, it's hard to get them um, off of you. And what the um, Van Eyck brothers are famous for, not only oil paints, but they paint scenes of daily life. They take like, here is Jesus being taken to Golgotha and crucifixion, but the people surrounding him are medieval peasants. So what they do is kind of time warp historical events, or they paint scenes of daily life, like a fresco back in the ancient Minoan times, so we see what life was like in northern Europe at this time. Along with them, we have some Renaissance literature. And the first one is a guy by the name of Baldessari Castellone. And if you guys um, have gone to, like, you know, um, Cotillion, you know, where you learn proper manners, like how to dress, how to dance, you know, where your silverware is placed, you know, your cup is on your left, and you go from outside in with four spoons and four forks and, like, seven knives. Well, Baldessari Castellone wrote the rule book on proper manners. It is how you are a gentleman or a gentlewoman. After that, people had to follow Baldessari Castellone's rules um, of order. And in England, we have Sir Thomas More's Utopia, 
What that simply was is we have a friend of the king who did not like some of the king's actions. So he writes a fictional story called Utopia, the perfect, most wonderful land. And in it, there's an undercurrent of sarcasm or criticism of the king, but since he didn't name his king, it didn't matter exactly, and he could not get into trouble. Sir Thomas More's Utopia. Big question you guys are going to tell me tomorrow is what actually happened to Sir Thomas More. And this brings us back to Dante um, Allegri, where in Florence, he writes his famous book, Dante's Inferno, about the concentric rings of hell. And the more evil you are, um, you know, you go deeper, you know, like the seventh, eighth, and ninth ring, as if you're, you know, you're Adolf Hitler, you're Joseph Stalin, you're just biblically evil giving modern-day perceptions on heaven and hell. And he purposely wrote it in Italian. So all of the learned scholars, the corrupt bishops and cardinals and aristocrats, would have to learn Italian as this book revolutionizes um, literature in Italy um, at that time. In the um, Anolfi marriage, this is back to the Van Eyck brothers, very crazy cool. You look at the husband and wife getting married here. She may or may not be pregnant. If you look back in the mirror, you see the reverse side of them. So looking at the artists, all right, the old Michael Jackson, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. You know, it is self-reflection. What am I doing? What is my purpose? What is humanity? Am I doing things for the right reasons? Kind of, you know, as he's painting this marriage, she's showing the background. Maybe we ought to think about our choices before we make them. Again, not sure if that's what his um, uh, you know, point of view was, but you can kind of see the backs of those people in the painting. You look at their faces, they don't, neither of them look very, very happy. Maybe in this arranged marriage, um, we don't know. And so this is where we're probably going to stop um, for the day. This is part one. There will be a second part. And that is, in England, we have William Shakespeare, good old Bill. And Bill is going to write 37 plays. You know, the Romeo and the Juliets and, and the Macbeths and the Othellos. Wait till you get to senior English. You'll read some of those. And he adds between 15 to 17 hundred words to the English language. Things like bedroom are all things that William Shakespeare is going to create in his plays. And they are going to be dispersed along with um, one of the greatest novels in the world. Um, uh, second only to the Bible, I believe, is Miguel Cervantes' Don Quixote. Um, and that is a play about a former knight, Don Quixote, who rides off and he envisions he's hearkening for the old days. You're like, for me, like, oh man, I'd like to live back in the 80s where music was good and movies were good and fashion was great with fluorescence and big hair and, you know, um, you know, stonewashed jeans and, and um, all members of only jackets. And he and sees fictional things like he believes a windmill is a dragon so he charges it on his horse with his spear fighting off all of these enemies that aren't there and traveling with him is his put upon um, squire named Sancho Panza and if you really read it Sancho Panza is the common man but he is the renaissance man he understands times are changing and it's literature and it's learning and it's science and it's math and it's freedom and it's self-government and he is the real hero of the story well Don Quixote is a guy who wants to hang on to the past because he's losing his grip of power on the world a very 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 cool book if you ever get a chance to read it um, here's Sancho Pons here on the donkey and the old um, knight and all this is changed by one of the biggest game changers we know there was wooden block printing in China and Korea, but one of the biggest game changers in world history is Johann Gutenberg's printing press. Now a story 
can be mass produced. You can like put, it's like an old school photocopier. You don't have to hear somebody who's literate tell a story or he'll hear the town crier read a document. We can now make hundreds and thousands of them. First thing printed will be the Bible. Now the Bible is put in everybody's hands for them to read and to understand and to make um, uh, decisions. And so the written word brings education and literacy. And people begin to think and to ask questions about government and about the church and about their role in society. And it is a big, giant boost to humanism. We are going to stop there for the day, and tomorrow we are going to go through the Reformation. So please watch this by the end of the week, guys. If you have any questions, please let me know.